So, thanks for the intro. Indeed, we met a few years ago, and what struck me about Rob was he's very much a, a supporter um, and a missionary for all things about good UX. So, really the best person I've ever met, which brings me to my first point about uh, stakeholder management. Suck up to the boss. <laughs> um, it's in small type. But you might not see, I'm not saying that's the first rule. There is one rule at the back end of the presentation, which I think is quite crucial to help bridge that gap that Rob was talking about, to make um, the work that's done with the headphones on really appropriate and to have people on your side and to have for happy, proper workplaces. So, um, it feels like it's a bit negative about uh, user groups, it feels a bit negative about clients and so on, but it's not meant to be. It's meant to be a bit more light-hearted. Um, we're all the same, I think. The first type I would like to talk about uh, will be after I talk about me. So I think I do three things. So because I'm Irish, I do like talking. I did a coaching course about 10 years ago, which is very good for difficult questions. <clears throat> And if you're coaching people who are going through life traumas or business traumas, you start to get comfortable being uncomfortable. So if there's a, a question that needs to be asked, a coaching methodology helps you ask that question. So it's very often, what do you want? Uh, well, I don't want this. Okay, what do you want? And you might get what they want. And then what do you intend to do about making it happen? So quite iterative, quite tough uh, are, you know, the, the, the meat and, and, uh, of, of, of coaching. Doing something like uh, training for the Samaritans, again, brings out a different um, mindset when you're dealing with people, which is more to do with active listening and less to do with having a view as to what they should do or trying to take them down a particular mindset. So that's the background of me. So I've put together just seven kind of uh, personas, if you like, and the traits, the habits that might get on our wick as UX people and as project people day by day. The first is <laughs> people who act like a psychopath. And I want to ask a question. Um, what percentage of the population would be seen by the pros as being psychopathic? What percent? <laughs> <laughs> Um, they're all great guesses, and it's, um, it's maybe 10% in some of the organizations we might deal with, especially as we go up the tree. So it might, be, it might be lower in the general population, but I think at the top of organizations, whether it be you know, your Gordon Gecko type, it's actually quite a lot of these decision makers at least have these psychopathic traits. So the traits would be, um, they don't mind telling you you're awful. They don't mind rubbishing work you've done. They don't mind saying that they think UX is a load of whatever. It, it's no, it's not, make, it's not making them uncomfortable. Um, what makes them good, I suppose, is this diminished empathy. They can just say, we need to cut down that, we need to organize that, that needs to happen, I need to fire that group, whatever. Which is why they can go to the top. And disinhibited just means rude and hard to deal with. Um, so they're kind of get things done. So it's um, somebody who's sort of thinking, who, should, who else could possibly fit the stereotype of a psychopath? Maybe from fiction. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Basically, a lot of serial killers. Well, every serial killer. <laughs> <laughs> Every serial killer would be a psychopath, but not all psychopaths are a serial killer. They could be a CEO or head of this or head of that. Um, but there might be Dexter, who's a serial killer, I haven't seen it, who's like got some redeeming characteristics. So it's a, it's a, it's a muddied, it's not just they're all bad, and bad, mad, bad, and evil. Um, one of the things I've noticed recently, if you can perhaps read, perhaps not, the strategies I'm using is I didn't recognize a psychopath at the start of my career. In fact, this morning I thought of an absolute difficult individual to deal with in a project to redesign a website. I just this morning woke up and thought, yeah, he was a psychopath. I now understand, I didn't understand then what was driving that individual. Now I'd be able to do things differently. He was extremely charming, which is often a, 
um, a factor in psychopaths. And he gave me a lift to the station in his Rolls Royce, like the one that Alan Sugar has on The Apprentice. Um, but there's probably more to do with him being able to tell me how he saved 80,000 pounds on the list price than to give me a lift back to the station. The things I want to talk about is how I would um, uh, address that now is when an individual spent 300K doing a bad project with bad UX and I was reviewing it, um, there was bad news to give. But the good news about a psychopath is you can give them bad news. If they spent 300K, they have no real, they don't hate themselves over it. So what I did in terms of a quick presentation was to do 24 slides, tons of background, looking at people's perception of the existing UX. But I said, I fanned out the 24 slides as a, as a grid and said, I'm gonna save you time, I'm gonna save you an hour and just give you the last slide, which was the one that said, it's really, really bad. Your 300K is gone, fire the agency and start again. That worked for that characteristic, for that sort of individual, that worked fine. He didn't want to go back to the, the workings, if you like. He didn't want to see tons of detail. So high risk, but for that personality type, not so crazy. I think everyone's familiar with indecision crippling what could be good work. Does that look familiar? But you know what? We're all the same, aren't we? We all have areas of our lives where we just put things off or muck about or half-heartedly do something or don't give something full commitment. Uh, fear is probably the key thing that drives indecision. And um, boy, I do find this difficult to deal with. Great projects that could work well, not ever really. Well, Rob alluded at the start. Stuff that doesn't happen like it should do, stuff that doesn't happen at all. Stuff that's put into the long, kicked into the long grass. Um, one thing that's great about lean and lean UX these days is you can say to people that instead of having to know everything in advance, which is an in, it, it's impossible. You can, instead of saying lean will make things happen quicker, or it'll save you money, or produce a better you know, user experience, I've been able to talk with people and say, this approach means you're never more than a little bit out from you know, where you should be. Because of the iterative nature, because you're coming back and looking at stuff, testing with the hypothesis with users, and I give an analogy of a flight path for a plane, which is never, 98% of the time, is probably a little to the left or a little to the right of where it should be. But overall, by making minor corrections back onto its flight path, it ends up in the right airport at the right time. So I think, you know, if you think about it, there are other reasons for indecision. I'm wary of walking too closely to the boom mic. Um, there are other reasons for indecision, but I think fear is, uh, is underpinning a lot of the crazy stuff where people put stuff off. Um, and if that's the case, um, one way I've used is when I'm doing user research, not so easy with remote user research, user using testing or something, but if you're actually talking to real live users and having them go through tasks and you're videoing them, as well as the tasks, I will make sure to ask um, what would it be like if this site was as easy to use as such and such? And let them answer open what their answer is. If you do about five or 10 or 12 such um, task-based tests and you end up with five or 10 or 12 responses to that question, you can then splice all those together. You know, what would you as a user like? What would we like if we did this right? Splice them all together, you almost have a um, a uh, recruiting video that would, might enthuse people. I have shown that to um, somebody who's dithering about doing UX properly. I've shown them, a, before asking them, do we want to go ahead, I've shown the blooper reel of people giving feedback. So they hear 10 yeses in a row. It makes it easier for them to say yes. It's really simple psychology, but we're proven to like saying yes, 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 and yes. And we're proven that we like to agree with loads of people. So if we see 10 or 12 people saying, I'd be buying off this every day if it was great, it does something to us in here. It can overcome the 
indecision and the fear. I really get worked up by organisations and people who put saving money to the top of their list of things to achieve when they go to work. Especially when it comes to you know, a digital world where money can be wasted very easily, I think. These, uh, on the right hand side um, is a piece, is, um, is from the world's most authoritative newspaper, which is... Yes, you can, you can see <laughs> their, their, their colour scheme. Uh, it's a rehashed public relations thing, obviously, um, whereby a taxi company, maybe Get Taxi, did a, a survey of all their taxi drivers and said, which cities are the best and the worst in the UK for giving tips? That constitutes news in the world of the Daily Mail. Um, but I found that uh, I can, um, I found the worst, were, I've clipped there, which you can see really easily. And guess anybody, who, which, which city would be the best city, the most open-minded, the most tip-friendly, the most taxi-friendly people? <laughs> yes, all cities you'd like to live in. <laughs> um, but uh, one thing that strikes me, and, and it, it, I find it irritating about um, people and organisations who want to scrimp on doing what we believe to be a really good methodology, a really good foundation, i.e. proper UX in user research and so on, is often I find in their, in their own lives they're very, very amenable to the quality uh, offerings. You know, their, their hi-fi might be a hi-fi that's made of components that will never break down or has a 20-year guarantee. A lot of what they do in their real life can be really, really quality, but when it comes to work, they have the blinkers on and do stuff that's short-sighted, cheap and nasty. So, I'm not sure there are any easy ways around that, um, and my experience is it's a really tough thing to help, help a company raise their game and do things right. But obviously, this, it's said as people think in three ways. One would be um, they, they touch, so the kinesthetic, another is people here and other people, they, 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 they're visual. But for a company who had a really awful sign-up procedure where you, where you um, gave all your preferences, you gave your country, you gave your continent, you gave your work email address, you gave everything, we were able to put users um, login time or sign-up time, and if we put them in blue, we were looking at sign-up times of you know, three and four minutes. And just by putting their competitor, their most hated competitor, in green beside them, you're able to, you know, close your mouth, let them see it, and some will feel a, a fear or a, I don't know, a, a willingness to spend. Especially if you put it together with, if they're spending 5k um, a week and their competitor is spending 50, you know, you're starting to help them see that they're Scripting and saving is costing them in terms of usability. In that case, they did get the picture and they did agree to completely rationalize a sign-up process, which, to get back to the point that Rob was making about collaboration, it meant talking to marketing people in the same room who'd say, well, we want them to tell us everything about them themselves. Salespeople who say, we're not going to call them unless they give a telephone number, their work email address, um, their, their position from a pull-down list of um, titles. But, you know, getting them all in a room and saying, this is not tenable, thank you for agreeing it's not tenable, how do we actually get it down to four or five that we can all agree on is, is, is important. But it, there's no, I don't, don't think there's any, any really easy way in terms of collaboration to get people to spend what's appropriate, to be frank. Unless you want to share with, in the question section or for a beer afterwards. Um, I do tell a story, um, which is true, and it's about the fact that I was with an agency when they started 10 years ago, lost a lot of business by quoting a good price to do a good job, and did badly for two years. But two years on, started to get a lot of incoming uh, requests from the people who had walked away from them two years previously, from the people who had spent loads of money doing things badly and we're seeing enough data to start to appreciate doing well. 
so they did fine two years on. And that's a true story, which makes, means I can say to people, you know, do you want to do it badly and come back and do it properly in two years' time? It's a harsh thing to say, but it's true. We all know it's true. I think as dreaming is positive, isn't it? Dreaming is an entrepreneur who has a great vision or a company who want to shake up their area. Um, delusional as a habit is a problem. This is real life, and the quote on the top bottom left is from a company I was brought in to advise who wanted to do something completely do a great novel, to be fair. They were so hung up on how great their idea was and their 110 million they wanted to spend to make it happen that our proposal was, um, uh, yeah, we can work with you. We can do stuff. Here, here's what we'd cost. Uh, and they came back pretty much and said, if you could do three months around user experience for free, and you could give us money every month for us to continue business as normal, we would then look after you very much when we start to roll out these, this great process down the, the years. That's delusional, isn't it? That's not dreaming, that's delusional. Yeah. Um, so we've done an NDA and so on. It was very, very disappointing. And we just know it will never happen. And even if somebody agrees to, to work with them for free and give them money, it's still never going to happen because the thinking isn't, it isn't right. This is a common where you, where you know it takes, you need executive time to do things right. You need buy-in and it's hard to get it sometimes. Does that feel right? To, does that feel a common problem for people? No easy answers. But at the start, Rob mentioned um, collaboration, having people involved, invested. Um, and that, in essence, is the key thing. And I think if an executive or somebody you need to have as part of the team feels that things being done to him or her, they do have a natural inclination to not quite make the meeting or <laughs> be at the meeting but be on their Blackberry or, you know, arrive late and leave early. Um, so getting people to buy into the, to the, what's the big purpose is difficult. I won't say this is the only answer, but it did work for me and a colleague recently. We were meeting um, people a lot and we had bad behavior from the client. So what we ended up doing is rearranging our workflow to, to work on Tuesdays morning, Wednesday morning and Thursday morning early and replay to them the previous day's learnings. So the company where they had sales, marketing, product management, technical people um, deciding what the user experience should look like, we would take all that, we do like hand-holding workshops, run away in the afternoon, come back with crabby drawings of how it could be done differently and have them fight, you know, for an hour or so over what we've done wrong or give us feedback. So it meant we'd do long days but come back the next morning with something which on the average got closer, the iteration got closer to what they could agree on. Um, Alison's into stakeholder workshops, I'm sure you'll have tons more ideas about how to get people working in the round, which I'm looking forward to. But yeah, not sharing their time, because at the end, if it doesn't quite work, they're not going to say, to be fair, we didn't give it enough time. No way. They're going to blame it on the UX people, the project people who they've hired. Does anyone feel that its companies are just too, too close, they keep data too close to their chest? I kind of understand this, especially with, um, you know, people they're new to. It's not a bad thing in itself. Um, one thing I tend to find helpful is just, just sh showing that you're, um, you're treating everybody else's data confidentially. You're not casually talking about competitors or people you've worked for. Um, if they won't give you actual data, I think you can say, can you give me the output? You know, what are your thoughts? What are the, what are the hypotheses you'd like to test? You know, what's the outcome that you feel has come from this data you paid tons and tons and tons of money for? That can be helpful. Um, one thing which is high risk, again, saying that you're comfortable looking at difficult stuff. And um, an example I give is a company who 
definitely saw their offer as a luxury offer. And I, they had done tons of data, they weren't sharing it. But I said, did some guerrilla testing where I'd ask people to rate their website and interface um, in terms of its luxury and appeal, and would they suggest this website to a cool friend of theirs? The result was very poor. People wouldn't recommend the site. People didn't see it as a luxury offering. People didn't see it as high-end. And by bringing that back, which I did free of charge to the client, I was able to let them, like, you know, get open with me and say, right, perhaps you're onto something. And that unlocked some further research and some further UX. Part of the reason, I think, was um, if somebody's working for a company for a while, they all fall into you know, a groupthink mentality. It's natural. So they all think, oh, everyone thinks we're the best in our marketplace, be it cosmetics or beauty products or their of clothing. That's natural. And a big and final issue is um, how do you get organizations to really feel empathy for their users? For part of the same reason. They think everyone knows we're great. Why can't, they, why can't these bloody users give us all this information or whatever it might be? Um, this will be covered better by Matt when it comes to improv. But I was in a difficult, oh, my strategy overall, by the way, is GDS, Government Digital Service, do this really well. They definitely have an organization there that is very much tuned to the users. And they've done that really, really effectively, I think, from everything I've seen. Part of the reason is everybody who's involved in remaking government digital services has to spend time in front of users. I think it's only two hours a uh, I think it's only two hours a month, but nonetheless, they're seeing videos or looking through the walls, the video wall, the, um, the, the mirrors at people testing products, you know, in live. So, they're doing a lot right. Um, and also, they're humble, which I think is important, being humble about the fact that um, if you uh, are in the Ministry of Justice, you know, the people who come to the Ministry of Justice are normally, you know, it's, it's a problem time for them. And being humble means we don't give them loads of stuff. We try and work out what it is they want. We try and be empathetic with them. So the GDS is good. A really simple example would be where I um, found a development team were trying to make a trading application. The development team had never been on a trading floor. So one way to help them understand the need for simplicity in a great UX was to mock up a trading position. So you have loads of uh, monitors. We played music and noise at them. We had an actor um, ask them questions as they were trying to do some tasks. And basically, we do some before and after testing, and everyone's, everyone's score on the games plummeted as we threw more stuff at them. Now, it was a bit of a fun thing to do, but I did help the team recognize that the users in their natural environment were stressed, and overstimulated, short attention spans you know, in the real world. So, um, as I say, Matt will talk more about, we, had, we just used one actor. The good thing about actors is they cost less to hire than some of the, sadly, than some of the, uh, you know, the professionals you might want to get involved in this sort of stuff. Um, that is, I am hopefully just on time at a quarter to. One golden rule, so I was teasing about those, the golden rules at the front, but actually I think it's just your, your intention. You know, if your intention is to help an organization look after the users better, help them, you know, avoid going bankrupt, help them recognize, you know, the problems they have, um, or maybe motivate them to do things right. If you can get your intention right before you walk in to um, work with a client, you can stumble and make mistakes, but I still think that intention will carry you through and have people buy into what you're trying to achieve and give you the, the support to make it happen. I reckon that is it. Thank you.